The Star Citizen universe is vast, set hundreds of years in the future in a large galaxy filled with unique challenges. With millions of individuals and hundreds of groups vying for power, it's easy to get lost. That's why I'm here to be your guide. Welcome to Galactic Historian. This is a series where I break down the lore of sci-fi universes. Also, welcome back to Citizen's Guide to Lore. This is a series where I help those citizens who are looking to start getting into the lore of Star Citizen. This episode will cover the major players in the lore of the verse, all the large political factions of the game. This will include all of the non-human races and the three major political parties of the main human government. If I don't cover a faction you're interested in, I've likely covered it in the past or we will talk about it in the future, so be sure to hit me up on the comments below and let me know what you'd like to see. I'll begin with the main factions you will have the most time and encounters with, the human government of the United Empire of Earth, or UEE. The UEE is not the only place where humans live, but it's the largest and most powerful government for humans in the Star Citizen universe. At its core, the Empire is divided up into two categories of people, civilians and citizens. Civilians are still members of the UEE, but can only vote and hold office locally, meaning their home planets. Citizens can vote and hold high office, specifically in the UEE government. Civilians can become citizens if they do something beneficial to the UEE. The easiest and most common way of doing this is by serving in the military. The founding of the United Empire of Earth itself stems from a tyrannical dynasty of a family called the Mezers. Its founder, Ivor Mezer, was a war hero who swayed the people and made changes he felt would make humanity stronger. Over the centuries, his descendants became more and more ruthless, using xenophobia and terror to keep people in line. A revolution in 2781 ousted the last Mezer and reformed the UEE. Today, the UEE is functionally a democratic republic. At its head is the democratically elected Imperator, who serves as the chief executive for the government and the head of the military. The position of Imperator is limited to one 10-year term, and only a citizen can run for election. The rest of the elected government is made up of senators from the various planets that make up the UEE. Inside the UEE, there are many different political factions, Though the main factions can be found inside the three main political parties, the Centralist, Universalist, and Transitionalist parties. The Centralists tend to be on the far-right spectrum of politics, and libertarian in economics. They believe in a strong military and a humanity-first ideology. They believe aliens are making the UEE weaker and are plotting to overthrow and take over the Empire. They also believe in loosening restrictions on corporations. They firmly believe in tradition and keeping the center of power on Earth. The Universalists are in the middle of the spectrum when it comes to politics and the economy. They generally are the moderate party, having the majority in the Senate, and are seen as the moderate in politics, believing in guaranteeing the rights of all citizens, while also believing that the government should control and shepherd the people. They believe in legislation to moderate the economy, but are firm believers in opening trade with humanity's neighbors, especially the Xi'an. Finally, the Transitionalists are on the far-left spectrum of politics, and tend towards the left economically as well. They are the only party that believes that the capital must be moved away from Earth to the world of Terra, which is a separate planet and system in the universe of Star Citizen. They push to include more people in the government seeking to abolish the age-old citizen and civilian system. They also want to reduce the military and increase government spending into arts, education, and sciences. They are also much more open to diplomatic, economic, and cultural exchanges with our alien neighbors. Most of the opinions of your average civilian or citizen can be broken down into one of these three different factions. As such, these political ideologies play an important factor in your own experience in game. They affect everything from the missions you accept to the events that will occur. Next, we'll talk about the largest faction outside of humanity in the game, the Xi'an Empire. The Xi'an are probably the only species which is at par or even more advanced than humanity. They are much longer lived than humans, some living well over 500 years. 
Their government is that of a genetic monarchy, with their emperor required to have very specific genetic markers in order to take the throne. The rest of the government is run by various noble houses, making the empire effectively a feudal system of government. Loyalty and order is kept by mandatory military service, where young male and female Xi'an are forced to give up their family names and serve the emperor directly. This breeds loyalty to the empire over family, and these forces are used to keep order in and around the Xi'an Empire. Economically, even their businesses are partially owned and controlled by the government. Thus, everything must meet the approval of the emperor in order for it to be produced or designed. Now, this doesn't mean that the emperor personally oversees and signs off on everything, simply that the government can and does step in if something seems to be against the common good. Overall, they're dedicated to the idea of purpose and order. Their planets are even given singular purposes for military, religious, governmental, or industrial purposes. They are descended from a species that were not at the top of the food chain on their home planet. That biological hardwiring of survival is still at the core of the species. They are a secretive people who prefer subterfuge than open war with their enemies. They prefer getting what they want without firing a shot and rarely open up to outsiders, giving Nanjian just enough information to prevent them from looking too secretive without giving away their strength. This tendency towards clandestine actions actually played a role in the overthrow of the tyrannical Mezer dynasty. You see, they gave shelter to human anti-government radicals and then smuggled them back into the UEE when the time was right. That same tendency also led to an increasing distrust of them by many humans who see them as manipulative and trying to take over the UEE without firing a shot. Others see their role in the overthrow of the Mezers as a mutual beneficial act of solidarity with humanity, helping us oust the tyrants that had brutally ruled over humanity for centuries. Next, we'll talk about the most open of humanity's neighbors, and sometimes the most confusing, the Banu. The Banu are a very decentralized species. There is no strong central government of the species, and they don't believe in preserving and recording history. As a result, even the identity of their own homeworld has been lost to time. However, they do have some light bonds that tie them together, especially when it comes to their relationship to the outside universe. The Banu are a species built on the ideals of individuality and skill. The Banu respect skill and desire the unique. They love to watch a skilled craftsman or athlete work and are often seeking priceless items or artifacts, no matter their actual monetary value. This means they highly value things from other species they encounter. An example of this is Satabal, a human zero-g sport which the Banu have taken to vigorously. When they were first exposed to the sport, the Banu were transfixed to the skill of the players. It isn't clear if the Banu had the concept of athletic sports before meeting humanity, but they seem to have adapted to them today, as they have their own teams and have built their own stadiums all over their space. They look at the sport differently than humans, however. Most stadiums now have special Banu seats, which they will cheer regardless of who's winning or losing. To a Banu, the enjoyment of the sport is watching skilled competitors leave it all on the line for victory. The skill is what is important, not the results. Skill, uniqueness, and cooperation is highlighted in what sits at the core of Banu culture, the concept of the Suli. It's hard to explain the Suli other than as a cross between a trade guild and a family. Sulis are groups of Banu dedicated to a specific thing, be that running a government, building ships, or playing sports, with a leader of the Suli, called an Esso Suli, acting like the head of a household. Sulis can and are often dissolved, or form anew, all the time. The goal of each Suli and the Banu inside them is to be the best at what they do. If a government Suli figures out a more efficient or better government, then they will change to that government. If a ship can be built with better components, then a ship Suli will change the way they build their ships. As a result, there's no need to keep track of where the Banu have been, as it is irrelevant to how they can make things better. These Sulis work together when needed to ensure that each other is efficient and harmonious. They also periodically meet in what is known as the Banu Protectorate to decide large political decisions that impact all of Banu space. 
Well, they can of course ignore the decisions of the Protectorate. The Sulis rarely do this because the larger government acts as a streamlining of relations with all the Sulis and those political institutions outside of Banu worlds. All of this has led to them being known as the trade species of the galaxy, as their skill is best seen through their production of goods and ships. However, in this pursuit of perfection, they also have a darker side. The Banu are one of the only species in the galaxy which not only allow, but promote the institution of slavery. Now, slavery in the Banu Protectorate is more akin to indentured servitude than chattel slavery. This means that the slave is more a contract laborer than a piece of property. In fact, the Banu sell their children to specialized evaluation Suli, who then test them for their skills and sell those children off to other Suli where their skills would be best placed. However, these Suli have also been known to take humans against their will, and likely prize humans for the uniqueness. This means that humans have a mixed relationship with the Banu. On one side, they are very close allies to humanity. Many Banu will work alongside humans in jobs ranging from the legal to the criminal, and are seen by their colleagues as experts in their field due to their dedication. On the other side, they are often seen as chaotic and dangerous, a backward species that still enslaves others and lacks a moral center. Lastly, we'll talk about the main villains of the Star Citizen universe, the species that only the Banu have had partial success in dealing with, the Vanduul. Much of the details of the lives of the Vanduul are unknown to us. However, we have learned a lot from our encounters with them over the last 400 plus years. We know they are a spacefaring tribal nomadic species. They value martial prowess amongst all else. Bravery is also likely one of the highest virtues, as the higher the rank of a Vandal is in their tribe, the less protection they will wear into battle. The center of the Vandal tribe seems to be what we call a kingship, a massive space frame that grows and changes depending on the needs of the clan. Other ships are built solely to support the needs of a clan, and it isn't known if every Vandal clan actually has a kingship in it. Their main means of sustenance seems to be harvesting worlds en masse. They gather resources and turn them up into a paste which they use to build their ships, and possibly even eat. Their harvesters are massive machines which have been known to strip planets bare for the benefit of their clans. Because they are nomadic, it is likely that there is no central government, making them less unified than even the chaotic Banu. It also means that there is no one political goal or power among the Bandul that we know of. There are records of Vandul attacking Banu, Xi'an, and human worlds and ships indiscriminately. It is known though that some Banu do have trained relations with some of the Vandul clans. It is almost universal that humans hate the Vandul. There are some that prefer negotiation, but no attempt to negotiate with the Vandul has ever been met positively by the warlike species. Humanity has been in a struggle with the Vandul for generations, and have just now finally started to push back against their invasions. So if you see a Vanduul in game, you know you have three choices. Fight, run, or die. Those are the major players of the Star Citizen verse. Hopefully this helps you better understand the larger picture of the universe you're playing in as it is developing further. Remember that all of these are brief overviews of complicated subjects and may change some over time. The purpose of this is to give those unfamiliar with the lore of Star Citizen a primer to better understand the universe they are inhabiting. Those who are more in the know about the lore will likely point out that I didn't talk about the Tavarin or the Krithok. The reason why is that at this point neither are really important to the overall story of Star Citizen, especially those who want to know about the larger stellar political situation they are playing in. However, there will be a separate video where I discuss the current situation of the Tavarin, so keep an eye out for that. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and would like to thank those who have helped chip in with our little project by subscribing on our Patreon. You want to help grow this project even further? Even something as small as $5 a month can help these videos come to life. Want to know more about the species of Star Citizen? Which political party do you most identify with? Be sure to let me know what you think in the comments below. And as always, remember, ex historia ad astra.